Okay, uh, it's about time to start. I don't have too many people here yet. Um, kind of um, kind of a heads up, maybe spread the word. I've been getting some um, uh, things from administration that uh, for these blended classes, they don't, um, um, they, they, they're, they want some requirements that they're not all online. So that basically they're, they're telling me that I might, that I shouldn't be doing the Zoom sessions every time. So um, anyway, like spread the word on that. So I might have to um, um, do some of these sessions just uh, uh, completely in class um, and, and not post the Zoom. Um, I mean, yeah, if you don't like that, you know, uh, uh, complain to administration, because uh, I, I don't really see the harm in it. But uh, anyways, that's kind of what I've been telling, been being told. So just keep that in mind. So, so I might have to start posting uh, at least half of these sessions or so um, where we're only doing these in class. So I'll make more announcements about that when we need to. Um, but uh, probably this week, um, and today and Thursday, I'll still do Zoom sessions and we'll see going forward here. So, um, so, I mean, I'd planned on kind of going over test two materials here, see if I have any questions about that. I did post example solution um, on this. So, so I'll just go there, a few things that I can say about that, see if anybody had some questions on it. Uh, I don't quite have them all um, turn, return back to everybody yet. So um, I was almost done with them here. Um, but, but yeah, I should get those posted back with the, uh, the you know, the, the specific feedback for everybody um, here, uh, not too long after we're done with class here. So, um, and, uh, and yeah, I thought maybe I'd go over the problem set three, see if we had questions on that, although we'll probably do that more on Thursday then. Um, so, I mean, as usual, you've got a problem set this week and program assignment next week. So I'll probably talk more about the problem set on Thursday and begin looking at the um, program assignment then. So, um, all right. Let's... Let's look at these questions. Uh, I'm gonna go through all these. Um, and in fact, if you look through the example examples posted, um, uh, everybody had three questions, uh, but for like the first one and the, the third one, um, there was multiple versions of them. So you only got one of the different um, uh, versions. So I'm gonna go through all three of these versions. So you have to maybe go and find the particular one that you got if you want to get the particular answers, but I'm just going general through like one of these for the first one. So, um, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's, um, I didn't have a whole lot of, of people on this first one getting them completely correct. Um, and um, um, I thought people would get a little bit better on this first one. So, so, so the basic idea on this is this on this first one. So, so you had to understand the process states um, and kind of how they transition and then sort of translate these events like this uh, descriptions into what that implies for the state that the process is in, right? So for me, the easiest way to do this is to, um, uh, for every step that you see, to, to update the state. So, so basically what I was looking for you to give me the checkpoint um, um, you know, the, at each one of these four different time steps, what state was implied by the process, by the things that happened to it before that time step. So time 18 for the first one, for this first version of the problem. So everything starts off initially in a running state that was given in the problem here, um, except for uh, there was only six processes. So a lot of people only gave me six processes, ignored process seven, or some people had process eight. So I don't know where that was coming from. Um, and uh, I mean, another common problem is, you know, I, I was asking for what the state was for all these. So, so you know, you, you really did time 18, 18 need to tell me what the state was for each process, whether it was um, um, ready running or blocked or suspended, right? 
So from the information given, you couldn't really tell whether it was just currently in the ready state or was the actual process that might be currently running. Um, uh, because we only gave things about um, like time slice expiring implies that the, the process went back to the ready state, uh, but we didn't have any um, any like like messages here like uh, process one was scheduled and is running on the CPU or something like that. So uh, so you mostly only knew that these things were ready, uh, maybe running, but uh, or on the ready queue like. Um, from something being signed out. So if a time slice expires, you know, you know that it was running at time 13 and it got returned back to the ready queue, just as an example. By the way, you know, if you go by these one by one, like, uh, you know, you have to figure out the, the state that these are changing into. Uh, and then at the um, um, checkpoint, just list those out, right? So at time five, uh, sorry, can't quite get everything on here, but at time five, um, process three executes a command to read from a disk. So that's an example of, of uh, a typical blocking event. Um, um, so anytime a process is running, so you know that process three was running on the CPU at time five when it performed IO, a, a read in this case. So it's gonna, uh, after time five, process three is gonna be in a block state. Uh, and it's going to be waiting on the event uh, to complete. So, so that read to complete from this unit set. Right? So, so yeah, time five, uh, P3 is blocked, waiting on the read from disk unit set. Um, and then I guess the other thing, um, I, I still, even though I think I mentioned this uh, a week ago before the, the test, uh, when I was reviewing a bit, um, I mean, there's still evidence that, that people are, are some people, so some students are, are fuzzy on the difference between blocking and swapping. So, um, I mean, it was, was, pro was possible for processes to be swapped out, uh, and that's different from being a block state. So, you know, anytime you got a message, uh, an event happening that a process is swapped out, um, it, it was suspended or swapped out. Um, so, I used S in this example solution uh, for suspended or swapped out, B for blocked. Are for ready or running. You know, that was really the only three states that we needed for this first short answer problem that you had. So, P6 was suspended at time eight there. Um, time 12, a pro new process was created. So I think for all three of these versions, I created a, a new process sometime within the first 18 or by step 28. So, there, so you should have had seven processes at least by the, the first or second checkpoint. And when a new process is created, um, it's going to be, I, mean, I probably would have accepted like if you made up a new state, uh, but um, from the process description, you know, you should have been specifying these as ready or blocked or suspended. So after it goes new, it's gonna be transitioned uh, into a ready state. Uh, that's the, the normal transition. Um, so this implies that process seven was, was created new and then was put into a ready state, put onto the ready queue um, by this um, um, event at, at 12, time 12 here, right? So, um, and then just finishing up for um, our first checkpoint here. So if, if the time slice expires, this was kind of, um, a no event in this this question. I mean, you know that that the process was running, but it's going to go back to a ready state. Um, so this is some indication. I mean, P P one was ready, uh, was probably running some time in between there, and but then at time thirteen, um, it time slice expired and went back to a ready state. So so, so it's just a, a initially you were given that everything was either ready or running. Um, so so you know that that if P one was ready. Um, it was selected to be running at some point, and then its time slice expired and went back to the ready queue um, at time 13. Um, so, so yeah, the main types of events happening though were either blocking or swapping in and out. Blocking and unblocking or swapping in and out um, in this example. So the last one on this first version of the problem one was another example of a blocking. So, so uh, you know that P5 um, should have gone to a block state um, at um, time 16 here. 
waiting on, um, uh, on on the right to complete uh, unit three. So uh, nothing else happens uh, in the first time, 18 time steps. So at time 18, if you just look at those events, you know, P1 was ready or running, P2 was ready or running um, in this version of the problem. Um, P3 and five were blocked, waiting on different things. Uh, P4 and seven, one and two were all ready or running and P6 was suspended, um, having been swapped out at uh, time eight there. Um, so, yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I was looking for like information about those, just those four, but yeah, if you showed like, like each time step, that's even better. And uh, if you didn't show it at 18, I probably am still gonna give you full credit as long as everything you showed at 16, the, the, the one that happened before that. But, yeah. um, yeah, and so on. So, so I won't go through blow by blow for the rest of these, but, but that's the basic way to get through this. So, so I was mostly looking for evidence. Um, but I guess um, maybe I will go a little bit further because we only showed examples of things getting suspended or blocked. So, so like if we continue on for this first version, um, um, we get uh, another example of blocking. So, so process three ends up blocking here at time 20. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. So, so, um, um, so this is an example of, of, of unblocks occurring. So, whenever an interrupt occurs, um, that's typically how um, the operating system regains control um, and is notified of I/O being finished, so it can unblock a process that was waiting on that I/O or, or waiting on whatever blocked it. Right. So, so yeah, time, time 20 is an example of an unblock event. So we know that P3 should have been in the block state um, and it should have become unblocked and gone back to the ready queue um, at time 20. Yeah. So that was P3. Um, another example, something being suspended, P7 gets swapped out then. Um, and then, then, yeah, yeah. So the corresponding event to unswap something or unsuspend something is, we just said that was swapped back in. Um, in this case, uh, and, and you know, again, it, it should have been that P6 was suspended, um, and then when it was swapped back in, it goes back into a ready state normally. Right. So again, uh, there there is some here. Um, I've had people sometimes, you know, uh, try and determine that it was like whether it was in a uh, blocked suspended state versus a ready suspended state. Um, you didn't really have that information. So you only know that whatever, you know, if it was suspended, it went back into um, um, into memory. Um, and um, But um, you mostly had to assume that it was going back to just a, a ready state here because uh, we didn't have examples of things being blocked when they were, or being suspended when they were in a blocked state here. So. It, was, it would have made sense to say that it went back to a block state if I had suspended it from a block state, but I didn't do anything like that. So, so the, the, the most logical thing to say is it goes back to ready after being swapped back in for, for all these problems, I think. So. Um, all right. So that was the first one. Yeah, and there's there's different versions of that. So make certain you check. Or you know, once I once I return the feedback on these, you'll get the, the whole feedback should be in the test as well for your specific problems. So you can find it from there um, as well. So um, yeah, like I said, I'll get I should get the feedback pretty soon after we're done here. So I was almost done. Um, So for question two, 
Um, I mean, you know, good answers would actually give me something for all four of these, you know, including a state tra transition diagram. But, um, but you know, to get the state transition diagram correct, I mean, it really would be helpful to have explicitly stated what the mapping was from this made up system, this made up operating system and its made up states um, to um, our textbooks, um, seven states, right? So um, again, what, what I was expecting people to be able to do from here, from the kind of the name or even more from the description uh, to be able to, to say, oh, well, that's obviously, you know, currently running. That's obviously what we call the, the running state um, in our textbook. Um, so, oh yeah, I had, had a map in here. Um, So currently running is, is pretty simple. That, that's that's the, 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 we, our textbook called running. Um, computable here in memory. Um, you know, so to understand um, uh, which these map to, you have to be clear about what we mean, what what swapping is, um, and how that works in our seven state uh, transition diagram from chapter three, chapter four. Um, so if it's computable, that's, uh, that means it's ready. I kind of gave a big hint in there. So, so these were both examples of ready states, uh, but the one was going to be ready and the other one was going to be the ready, but block, or, um, um, but um, swapped out, um, uh, ready suspended as our, um, these two computable uh, should have been mapped to um, um, ready states, so, so the computable in, in memory is just the regular ready and the computable outswapped is the suspended, right? So from these, these descriptions, all the things marked as outswapped were what our textbook called something in a suspended state. Um, And then the, the, the toughest part of this would have, been, would have been mapping the rest of these, okay? So um, the, the trick here or the, the thing that you had to, you know, understand from reading these process straight state descriptions was that we've got multiple um, states in this made up system uh, that are all doing things, keeping track of processes that are in different kinds of block states, what, what we call block states in our, and further, you know, like we had blocked versus things that could be blocked and suspended, um, um, some things could be blocked um, and um, just regular block, they're, they're still in memory, they're not suspended, um, but then others can be blocked. Um, and um, it's been swapped out of memory. So, so um, it would be a, um, a suspended process. Um, Block and suspended in these cases. So, so all of these last four um, are all examples of block, different kinds or different flavors of blocks. So another good thing when you discuss this on two and three would have been to say something like, you know, these correspond to the different types of um, blocked cues or block lists that our textbook talked about um, um, that would be um, a pretty common way of an operating system organizing things that are blocked, uh, you know, processes that are blocked on different sorts of events. So it can easily find um, the process that's waiting on a particular event when it occurs and, and, and blocks it. So, so in this example operating system, we are just, um, it, it must have just a couple explicit in one of those. So it's got, it's got basically four, a uh, virtual memory weight, uh, IO weight, uh, and voluntary sleep, and network device weight. So these are all examples of block states. Uh, um, all four of these, uh, including the first two uh, from the description, were meant to imply that these are all um, in memory. So these are blocked, but not sw suspended, not, not um, swapped out. Uh, and only two of the four, though, had corresponding suspended, block suspended states. So the voluntary sleep weight and, and the, the network device weight here. So. Um, I was looking for kind of these in memory versions and the other two is kind of being mapped to block states. 
uh, and then both two corresponding outswap ones makes most logical sense to be blocked to, to map to be mapped to the block suspended states. Right? Um, And you know, the discussion on two and three, I was mostly looking for some, some uh, in particular for uh, maybe some ideas of why only these two of the four um, have um, specific outswapped or suspended states here. The most logical conclusion is that um, the suspension process for the FROBUS operating system um, Part of this decision is to only suspend processes that are waiting on certain kinds of um, events, right? So, so in this case, you know, this this strongly implies that um, only processes that are waiting on network devices or have voluntarily put themselves to sleep will be selected to be suspended, right? Things that are waiting on virtual memory or I/O um, aren't um, going to be suspended in this operating system normally. But we don't have ex explicit outswapped versions um, for the processes. Um, so anyway, that that was kind of what the discussion was on there. So, um, so um, state transition diagram might look something like this. Um, so you know. This is basically directly from our textbook, except um, instead of having one block state, I've got kind of a collection of the four things that map to the block state here. But, but yeah, if, if we're currently running, um, something, some event occurs to call a, a wait, what, what our FROBUS calls wait. Um, so the process goes into one of those wait or block states. Um, and if an event occurs, go back to being computable. But only the, the specific two um, are going to be um, out swapped or or um, swapped back in um, but um, like in our textbook um, uh, things that are out swapped maybe their event does occur when they're suspended currently so in, in that case that would go to that computable out swapped um, state that, that we had in our system um, common things on this for, for people doing the event diagram. Um, a lot of people, for some reason, had um, didn't have like a transition from the, uh, the, the, the weight to the outswapped weights for the FROBO system. Um, although they, they drew these in and then have the transition from this back to computable. But but yeah, without, so for one thing, for a state transition diagram like this, I mean, pretty much, I mean, every state should have some way to get into it, um, right? So so if you don't have, have a transition coming into the state, there's no way for, for um, you know, the, the, the exception for that would be like the, 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 the new or the terminal state. Um, so, so the beginning or the end state for the state transition diagram. But, but most everything else. So, so yeah, if you didn't have any way to get into the out swap state, um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of a, a weakness on your state transition diagram. Um, um, you're saying that, that your operating system has no way to suspend processes without transitions into that. So that was, that was kind of a common thing. Um, I mean, and, and you know, another common one though is not making it explicit that you know you can only really go from these voluntary sleep weight to the out swap version, right? So there really needs to be a transition from just that specific one to the out swapped or back to the in, in swapped um, for those. Um, All right, so yeah, this was a tougher, a bit of a tougher question. Um, so it required you to um, kind of uh, uh, you know, apply and think about the uh, things that we had in chapter three, uh, these states and state transitions, and um, try and reason about you know, the differences between these two systems and what that implies about how this FROBA's operating system is working. Um, okay. 
Um, All right, um, and let's look at the last one here. So I did, I think, yeah, I mean, um, I, I did kind of suggest people um, um, review the um, Amdell's uh, law here um, because we have these questions using the um, using it um, um, to compute uh, the utilization, right? So, um, so. So again, there's multiple versions of this. So you might not get the particular one that I talk about here, uh, but in general, for all of these, um, um, or it's not really Andal's law, but yes, yeah, so I gave you explicitly the. The, um, the uh, expression here. So yeah, sorry about that. The, the um, 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 the utilization of the U, of, of the CPU can be approximated um, by looking at um, the um, number of processes in there in memory and um, the um, the fraction of the time p, because so the p is the fraction of time that a process spends waiting in the I/O. So, so if p is eighty percent, then that means eighty percent of the time is blocked waiting in I/O, and only twenty percent of the time is ready. Um, you know, it's unblocked, so it can potentially be scheduled to the CPU. Right. So, um, so let me talk a little bit about this. So, I mean, you didn't have to, to understand this, but um, um, it's not too tough to derive this from first principles. With a little bit of statistics background, um, so so think of like flipping a coin. Um, so the idea is that um, let's say that that the I/O utilization for process P is fifty percent, right? So if I only had one process, that would mean that only fifty percent of the time would that one process be unblocked. So only for fifty percent of the time could the CPU actually schedule that process. To use it, so so that means that well, one process that has a, 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 you know an I/O this P of fifty percent, the utilization of CPU is going to be fifty percent, right? Um, so if you know how kind of probability works, like if you had two coins, um, um, that that would give you um, the way to think about. So how would that relate to um, um, what the utilization might be if I had two processes that both had uh, you know, the 50% um, of the time being blocked and 50% of the time being unblocked, right? So in that case, um, um, you know, so it's going to be that, that you have to multiply out the probabilities, right? So 25% so of the time, both of the processes are going to be blocked, right, when you do that. And then 25% of the time, process one is blocked and process uh, two is not blocked. And then 25% of the time process two is, process one is not blocked and process two is blocked. And then 25% of the time, all three of the processes are blocked, right? But, but if you work that out, um, and I probably should have got something I could, so I could draw on here, but uh, if you work that out, I mean, only one of those four states, when you do that, is when will all, will both processes be blocked, okay? So, so multiplying that out, only 25% of the time will both processes be in a block state or will, Will you come up with two heads if you think of this as toss the coin, like heads and tails, right? Um, so, so think of the basic combinations from doing like a statistic off here. So, um, so but, but basically only when all processes are blocked are, is the CPU not gonna be able to be utilized. So, so in that case with, with two processes with you know, 0.5 IO, um, you'll get a, uh, um, 25% of the time they're both blocked, which means that I can potentially utilize the CPU 75% of the time. Right? And then, you know, again, you can, you can kind of read through the description here, but that that implies, um, you know, given that probability P, and so if I have three processes, it's going to be uh, 0.5 to the, th or three coins, it's going to be 0.5 to the three, um, is going to be the percentage of time that all three of them are blocked and one minus that is the, the, the time when at least one or more of the processes aren't blocked. So, so that gives you the, 
the potential CPU utilization, right? And then if P isn't 0.5, so if you don't have a fair coin, um, you just have to multiply um, whatever your P is, you know, so like 0.82, 82% uh, would be a P of 0.82 in this first version of the example problem, times the number of processes or the number of coins that you're going to flip. And, and really that P to the N is the number of, is, is the number of, is, is the, the ratio of the time when all processes are expected to be blocked, right? So one minus that is gonna be the time when one or more processes are available to be scheduled on the CPU. So, um, for all of these, I think basically for part one, you just had to do the same thing was um, um, plug in the numbers for the, the expression given um, so like if I tell you that the P is 82 and we've got eight processes, that implies that uh, uh, you know, 82 to the power of eight is, is 0 0.21, uh, 0.205 something, right? So, so that means that 20% of the time, all of the processes are blocked. And, and, and you know, that kind of makes sense, you know, the, the uh, 0.82 is the amount of time spent, the ratio spent uh, blocked, you know? So there's a pretty high probability that every one of these eight, each single process is blocked here, right? Um, but if I have eight of them, um, um, there's a good probability that at least one or more of them is unblocked. So 80% 80, 80 or uh, uh, at least one process is unblocked, um, which implies that the CPU could be running a process 80% you know, of the time or just about 80% of the time. Um, And then the second part of this was usually um, um, more complicated. Um, you had to uh, do some rearranging or work backwards. So for example, like in this first version, um, um, if we're given a goal of the utilization, so 92% implies that we need a, a ratio of 0.92 here. Um, and um, we have 12 programs in memory. So that, that means N is 12. So here we have to find the, the unknown is P, right? So, so if you have the expression like that, um, you have to work it out and find P. Um, I mean, you could have used logarithms, um, um, although, you know, simply if, if you have a calculator that can do roots, you know, to the, the nth root of something, um, you can just use nth roots to do these things. So, so from this expression for this particular problem, um, we need to know P. So um, we can subtract P to the 12th and subtract 0.92 to, to rearrange. So then we have the expression that whatever P to the power of 12 is has to be equivalent to 0 0.08, right? Um, so if we take the 12th root of that, we can figure out what P is, right? Um, so, so this implies that we've got a, an IO uh, 0.8102 will give us the 92% that was asked for, for CPU utilization. Right? You have to be careful because we want it to be greater than or equal. So you have to kind of round in the right way here, right? So you really wanna be smaller than that, than, than the, the full decimal digits here. So 0.81, so anything less than 0.8102 should give you a CPU utilization of 0.92 or greater. And um, I would like to see more people kind of check your work on problems like this, especially on problem sets, because you, you do have a bit of time limit on the test, but the, <laughs> the problem says is always good to go back um, and test your work, test your assumptions, right? So, so if you come up with P is 0.81, that implies that if I plug in 0.81 raised to the 12th to the original expression, that I should get 92% or 0.92 ratio um, on this one here, which you will get um, if, you, if you go back and check that. Um, so most of the part twos were either to find P or to find N, right? So I don't know if I have an example of N here. Um, so kind of real quickly on this version of the problem that some people got, um, um, instead of trying to find P and you're told that you, the number of processes, 
Um, you're given that we want um, 95% or better utilization. Um, and that the IO wait time is 85%. So, so this, from this, we have to figure out the number of processes that are implied um, from um, um, that expression um, in this case, right? So if you go for your basic equation, you can do kind of the same rearrangement. So, so uh, one minus 0.95 um, has to be you know, equivalent basically uh, in some um, inequality. 0.85 to the nth power. Here, um, it'd be helpful. Yeah, I mean, if you know how to use a logarithm, so so quickly using a logarithm will tell me that um, you know, the log of that divided by the log of 0.85 is going to be what my actual value of n is here. So, so you get 18 in this particular case where we had 0.85 for the I/O and 0.95 for the CPU utilization that we were trying to achieve here. In this case, though, um, it definitely um, also, you know, it doesn't make sense to have a, a fractional number of processes. So the, the correct answer is either 18 or 19. Um, and uh, if you plug 18 in here, you're going to see that you get, um, you know, so, so for the inequality, um, um, you need to be, uh, it needs to be somewhere above 18.4331 to achieve 95% or better, right? So 18 is a little bit too small. If you, if you plugged in 18 for n here, you'll get 0.94 something utilization. Um, but uh, but yeah, if you go back and check your work, 19 is sufficient. So that gives you 95 and a half percent or so close to it. But, uh, All right, um, yeah, questions on that. Um, so somebody's asking about test two. Um, yeah, so I haven't returned the feedback yet. I, I had about six or seven more. So look for those real soon after we're done with the session here. So, um, and then, yeah, you can go back and um, <clears throat> look at the posted solution and look at the specific um, feedback that you had on your, so, your work. So, so yeah, I didn't quite get them all just before the class started, so we didn't have to return them quite yet. Um, all right, yeah, so some other questions. The general things about these, I mean, now you kind of, uh, so we've had, this is our second test so far, you know, so, I mean, I hope that the problem sets are, are, are kind of good practice for the, the questions like these that we get on the test, the, the short answer questions, um, at least the, the um, kind of what you need to do for them. Uh, it is helpful though to do things like, um, you know, make certain you show your work on these, you know, so if you just give me the final answer and it's wrong, it's hard for me to get partial credit for that, you know, but if you give me kind of the steps that you went through to get to that, so even if you made a calculation mistake, you can get, most or all the, the credit, um, even if you made an arithmetic mistake somewhere. So it's always good to be showing your steps. It's always also a good idea to, um, um, to go back and check your work, especially for the written problem sets where you have more time to do these things. You know? so, so go back when you have an answer and make certain that it kind of makes sense um, um, the information you're given to start with to things. Um, um, and I guess kind of an, as another general thing, you know, so if I do give explicit kind of questions, one, two, three, four, make certain that you explicitly answer, so, you know, it's good to have in your answer, like one, um, question one, two, answer question two. You know, so don't make me search for them or, or wonder, did you really meet um, what I asked you to discuss on um, things like this? All right. Okay, so um, I don't know. In general, yeah, I mean, also on question two, um, well, there was one particular problem on question two that that's, uh, was kind of different from this, but um, um, I, I guess I already discussed. So, so there was uh, probably the, the biggest thing was was maybe not not explicitly mapping these out. That I was taking points off for and uh, having some things on the 
state can't transition diagram that to me didn't make sense, like not having a transition into the outflop state or things like that. Um, all right. So I think, uh, let's, so we want to ask more questions about those. Um, maybe I'll bring up the problem set three, uh, three here that you should be working on for this week. Uh, um, I got the right one here. Well, um, so actually, for this problem set, especially for the second part of this problem set, um, you will have to read um, um, the stuff in the um, chapter six. So um, I've got some videos about uh, doing um, deadlock avoidance and deadlock detection by hand. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to do this today, but uh, maybe I'll go through those um, in more detail um, on. Um, Thursday, um, but uh, you know you might want to, to to look at the videos. Um, I worked through the same. I worked through the examples of um, um, a, a bit of a discussion more more on chapter six here. Um, so for for our unit six that we have, but but I also worked through some of the examples of doing the deadlock avoidance and deadlock detection. Um, the, the examples from our chapter six textbook um, in the, the lecture video there. So, uh, but but yeah, I mentioned that because the the, the second part of, of the um, problem set, uh, you, I do ask you to do some uh, deadlock um, um, avoidance algorithm um, that we have, or the banker's algorithm uh, by hand. The problem set here, so, you, so you'll have to, to look through and read through that materials on chapter six uh, to do that part of the problem set. Um, I'll try and do a, a, an extra problem or two of, of deadlock avoidance and deadlock detection on Thursday if we get some time. Let's go before the problem set is due here. So. Um, so for the, the first question, um, it's kind of more from the, the, the chapter five. Um, so this has to do with uh, interleaving, okay? So, so what, you're, what you're supposed to be doing given these two processes is assuming that these two processes uh, aren't, are single threaded. So, so uh, all the steps um, in these, well, these look like two functions, but, but think of these two functions as being run um, in two separate processes. Or I guess alternatively, you could think of this as a single process, but but we run two threads, and, and, and function p1 runs in thread one, and function p2 runs in thread two. Right? Those, those are equivalent. So either way, you want to think of that. So um, what that means is that the, um, the 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 statements or the operations shown, like v and w for for p1, um, have to run um, concurrently, right? So. Uh, V can't run at the same time in parallel to W, right? And they have to run in this particular sequence. So uh, V always runs before W when, when P1 runs, right? And X always runs before Y, which always runs before statement Z or process two. Right? Um, and you should also think of these statements that they're um, indivisible, they're atomic. We talk about what we mean by atomic statements um, in chapter five. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, that means basically, though, that um, we can't interrupt in the middle of doing one of these statements like V, but, but we can interrupt and switch over to the other process uh, before or after uh, any of these statements, right? So we could execute statement V, get interrupted, P1 could get interrupted, and then we switch over to, to P2, and then maybe it executes X and Y, and then it gets interrupted and we switch back to P1 and execute W. Um, 
So all you have to do is show me all the possible interleavings. Um, and I, I gave you one of the possible interleavings. So, I mean, it could be that process one runs first. Um, so, it, and, and it runs all of the statements, VW. And then um, it gets interrupted or it's just done and, and we run process two. And so it runs its statements, X, Y, Z. So that's one uh, simple interleaving, right? Um, Um, yeah, so another thing I mentioned here, you know, I mean, it is possible for P2 to run first, you know, so, so don't forget those interleavings where um, X um, is running before um, one of the operations of P1 or some number of operations P2 run first before P1. Um, I didn't tell you how many possible, so all you have to do is give me a list of the interleavings, right? I didn't tell you how many possible there are. Um, Pretty easy to think of what an upper bound is on this. So, um, can you ignore that? That, for example, the, the limit. Is, so, W always has to happen after V. Okay, but but let's say um, again, go back to this kind of from statistics. You're counting up the number of combinations. So, um, um, I know that there's going to be no more than um, um, five factorial. Um, interleaving, right? Because if, if you think of, um, of just, um, I got five different statements, uh, V, W, X, Y, Z here. So if I could choose any one of the five to run first, say V, then I would have four that could run possibly second. So I could choose any of the four to run second. Um, and then after I choose the second one, I get any of the three to run third. Okay. So again, this is, if you took a statistics course, that's, that's how you figure out the number of combinations um, where order doesn't matter. So, so anyway, five, five factorial is like 120, so five times four is 20, times three is uh, uh, 60, times two is 120, yeah, so 120. So, so the number of interleavings can't be more than 120. It's, it's considerably less than 120 um, because uh, the way I just described it, it could be that I choose W first, um, and then I end up choosing V second. But that's not a legal interleaving because you know V and W always have to execute in sequence, um, and X Y Z always have to execute in sequence. So, so um, that limits quite a bit from the, the whole hundred one. It's definitely more than one or two interleavings. Um, all right, and then um, for part two of the problem set, uh, I ask you to, to do some banker's algorithm by hand. So I think for our program assignment, we're also going to be implementing banker's algorithm. So it's good to, to understand uh, what this is. Um, so, so the banker's algorithm is an example of a um, um, uh, a deadlock avoidance algorithm. So what it does is it now analyzes the current state of a system and decides if the uh, state is in a safe state or not, right? Uh, and the way that we use Banker's algorithm is that um, every time a new resource request is made by a process, we figure out what state, what, what new state would have to uh, the system would have to be in to satisfy that new request. And then we check that new state. And if that new state looks safe, according to this banker's algorithm, then we're gonna allow the request, right? So that's why it's also no, known as resource allocation denial because for every resource request, we're gonna make a decision whether to allow that resource to be allocated or to not deny that request because it would lead to a potentially unsafe state, right? And safe versus unsafe, so, so if a state is unsafe, that means that there's a potential for deadlock. So we want to deny resource requests that lead to unsafe states because unsafe states can lead to deadlocks, right? And if we do that, if we, if we deny unsafe um, um, resource requests, uh, we can avoid deadlocks occurring in the system. So this is one of the three deadlock prevention mechanisms that we talk about in chapter six here. Um, so for the banker's algorithm or resource allocation denial, we, we specify the state of a system using 
matrices, basically, right? So we have to have information about um, what processes are in the system. So for for um, um, for the, the second problem, problem set uh, three here, there, there's five processes actually. Um, our, our textbook numbers processes starting at one. Um, I, I numbered things starting at zero because that makes it easier for the programming assignment. So you, you do have to know whether you're using zero-based indexing or one-based indexing. Um, but yeah, in this case, we, we have five processes, but we use we started at index zero, so we we, we, we called them process zero, one, two, three, and four. Um, um, so to, to specify the state of the system, you have to say, okay, what are the how many resources do I have? So in this case, we have four resources. Um, so often we we generically just call this like resource zero, resource one, resource two, resource three. But um, in this problem set, I just called them A, B, C, D. So we got four resources. Um, you have to know the total number of each resource that we have. So that's what B is. That's the, um, um, or, I'm sorry, the V is, is the, the uh, at this current time in the system, that's the number available of each resource. Um, so we didn't tell you the total number of resources, um, or we did. So in the problem statement, we told you the total number of resources. So, so there's actually 12 total of, process A, but right now, at this time, only five are available. So that implies that seven have currently been allocated to other processes, right? Um, and there's seven total of B, but only three are available. So, so four must be allocated, right? Um, and three are available C and three are available D. So, so the, the total available has to be less than or equal to the, um, the, 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 the actual total for each process for a system here. So, so these are the actual uh, number of resources of each type, and these are the one, the amount that's currently available at this time, at, at time zero that we call it here. Um, okay, and so, so I've pretty much given away what you do for, uh, for one, you have to verify this available. So to verify the available, um, it, it's the relationship of the, the, the total of each resource, what's currently available and what's been allocated, right? So if I've got five available, I've got 12 total, that, that implies a certain number must have been allocated for resource A. You can find the allocate, I mean, that's gonna be the column for the allocation matrix, you know? So, so this is the particular num number that's allocated to process zero of resource A. So it has two of resource A, process one has zero of resource A. Um, but that, that's all I asked for one there was to, to verify the, 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 these availables are correct given the information that you're given here. Um, the need matrix, we didn't give you the need matrix. The need matrix is the difference between the claim that each process makes that it needs um, I shouldn't say that the, the claim that each process says it, it needs at a maximum, all right? So for the claim matrix here, where process zero says, um, I will never need more than nine of resource A. That's my maximum claimed amount of, of resource A, right? So one thing, I mean, your claims always have to be less than uh, the, the total number of resources we have in the system, right? So I should never see more than 12. I can claim that I need up, up to 12 if I have 12 resource A's in the system, but no more than 12. Um, and, uh, and then need is really just the difference between C and A, right? So if I claim I need nine, I currently have two, um, like process zero does of A, that means it needs seven. Right? So the need matrix is really just the relationship between C and A. All right, and then I'm going to I'm going to leave it to talk in more detail about um, how you determine whether the state is safe or not. So I first ask you to tell me whether this state is safe or not at T zero, um, and then I give you um, a new request. Okay, so P one. So here, what you need to do first for for step four is you have to show me the new state. Um, I should probably make this explicit um, for, for for here. So so the first thing you should show me is that if we granted an additional set of, of resources. So if, if we gave two more of A 
one of B, two more of C, and two more of D. Okay? So some people, um, th some people, um, uh, when I give them problems like this, um, take this to mean that I want P to end up having allocated two, one, two, two, but that's not correct. Okay, so I shouldn't end up with an allocation for um, P1 of uh, two, one, P2. This is in addition to what it currently has allocated, okay? So the new state, what we're saying here to give away part of, of question four is that uh, P1's allocation is actually two, two, uh, three, three. Okay, so you need to add this in to its current allocation. So that, that changes the allocation for P that, that, and that changes the needs for P and that changes the amount available um, if we were to grant that allocation. Okay. And once you do that though, once you have the new V, A, C and, and the need matrix, which you can call N, um, that's implied by this allocation, you can then again do what you did for three. So, so see whether that new state is safe or not, right? And that, that's really how resource allocation and now it works. So, so if, if, if a process requests some number of, of resources uh, we, we, from the current state, we see what new state would come if we granted those resources. Then we do the, the banker's algorithm to check if that new implied state is safe or not. And then we grant or not grant, depending on whether that new state is safe or not. Right? So that's the ultimate thing that I wanted for three and four. You'll know, say the state is safe or the state is not safe, right? Um, and that's what we're doing for our third programming assignment. So, so given um, exactly the same information in the state for the VAC uh, matrices, uh, give the answer that state is safe or that state is not safe. Um, and I'll leave, for now, I'll leave you guys to read the textbook about the banker's algorithm to determine whether they're safe or not and, or, and watch the lecture video where I talk about that. But I will go over these a little bit on Thursday as well for people still working on that part um, for assignment uh, for the third problem set here. Uh, okay, uh, so I missed, somebody asked a question. So um, A cannot have more than a maximum claim that is nine for process zero. So, um, yeah, so, so I think you were talking about, the, I mean, that, that's kind of a, a limitation um, of, of the, the, the maximum claim matrix. Um, so it's nonsensical to have a claim matrix in a system where I only have 12 of A where a process says it could potentially need more than 12 of A. So in fact, when a new process is started up um, for the banker's algorithm, the, the, a new, so if I start up a process five, I have to say what my maximum claim is before I start process five. Um, and in a, in a system that's using banker's algorithm, before it would allow process five to start, it would check all the maximum claims that they are no more than the actual resources that I have of each type and it wouldn't allow the process to start um, if, if I say I need eight of resource B in a system that only has seven Bs. But, uh, right? All right. Um, other questions? Uh, I guess my main one would be like, so back for, I guess, for the, uh, the, the test. Mm -hmm. So it's like I the way I answered it. So for the I guess second question part one, where it's asking to like separate them, like or, you know distinguish which uh, state they would be from the diagram. Question one, right? Right. Yeah. So I I wrote the states off to the left of like because I guess it's both both running out of time. I kind of like, just kind of wrote down like kind of copied like the. Um, like you know what each thing was and then like their description whatever so to the left of that that's where i wrote down like what they would be from okay um yeah, so the, the question was about uh, on the test about problem one again. Um, so probably what I would say is, yeah, look at the feedback I gave and um, um, if um, it looks like I didn't give you 
enough credit and uh, I wasn't, um, um, I mean, uh, certainly for them, this goes for everybody, you know, so, so yeah, after that, um, if you look at the feedback and, and you think that you had it and I'm taking points off, uh, definitely, you know, email me and, and, and ask about it um, and, and I'll take a closer look, right? Um, so, but, but yeah, and the particular thing that you're describing and it could be that, that I might um, go, I might um, pass over that. Um, um, so, so I'll have to, to see kind of the details of what you're saying. So, um, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm hopefully, I am looking for people somewhere that I could tell what they thought the state was for all seven processes at each time step, um, or at least at each checkpoint time step somewhere. Yes, because I like suppose I kind of hand wrote it on note paper. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know what you would show up on this point, right? Yeah. But, yeah. After I give you feedback, um, let me know if something you get or something. Yeah. Um, all right. So yeah, I think that's it for today's session. So I'll go ahead and end this session. Um, I'll post this as usual. Like I said, for people that, that maybe join a little bit later, unfortunately, I might have to be changing the format of our help sessions here. I've been getting a little bit of, um, I don't know how to describe it, but the administration is objecting to uh, providing what I think are perfectly helpful, um, you know, uh, Zoom sessions uh, for people. But um, um, anyway, so some of these sometimes might have to be completely face to face. But I'll make some more announcements about that. Um, but um, yep. So that's it for today. I'll go ahead and post this for people that are watching this asynchronously, um, and I'll see you guys later. Then.